Hi, I'm Anna. Welcome back to Books on the Go. I'm here with a March wrap-up, a little bit belatedly, but I've had a bit of juggling to do with the children being at home doing uh, home learning and now on school holidays in lockdown. So that's interesting. But nevertheless, I've still managed to read a little bit and it's been an interesting month. So March, we were very hectic for the first half of March with the Adelaide Festival, Adelaide Writers Week and the Fringe Festival and everything happening. And, you know, I was out every night um, busy during the days as well. And so the, I didn't get as much reading done as usual for that those few weeks. And then we sort of went into this lockdown phase. And so I've, I've picked up my reading a bit, but it has been an interesting time. So let's see. The first one is Till by Daniel Kelman, translated by, from the German, by Ross Benjamin. And this one, I loved Daniel Kelman's Measuring the World, which was about two I, don't, I want to say astronomers, but I've forgotten exactly the details now, but two, I think, physicists or mathematicians, and it was just really engaging and really charming and quite funny and intelligent, and I loved that a few years ago and didn't realise he had a new book coming out, and I was in imprints a few weeks ago and saw Till and so I had to buy it immediately to, and break my book ban and just because I was so excited I didn't know that you know he had this novel coming out. It's now been shortlisted for the Man Booker International Prize which I'm very happy about. So this is a book about Till who was a, a figure in German folklore which um, I hadn't heard of him before but I'm sure that if you're familiar with German fairy tales and folklore you might know the name so he's a mis mischievous or mischievous prankster who is quite demonic in some depictions but he plays practical or the story goes that he lived in the sort of 1600s and played practical jokes on people and maybe lived in the woods. I don't know how much of this, you know, how much of that was in the original stories. But um, what Daniel Kelman has done is given us Till as the protagonist and actually built up his story. So taking it from when he was a boy and why he goes into the woods and, and the family life that he was running away from and how he sort of survived and had to be quite tough. And then he's woven in all these historical figures who lived at that time. So we have Elizabeth Stewart, who I hadn't known much about before this, but she came over to Germany, or I'm calling it Germany, but there were different regions and I, I've forgotten because it's a it uh, feels like a, it was a few books ago that I read it, so I've forgotten all the place names, but um, Elizabeth Stewart came over and married a German prince. And so that was all really interesting. And at one, in one scene, she's thinking back to her time in the palace in England and meeting William Shakespeare, who tells her that he has a son called Hamnet. And then coincidentally, Hamnet, the book by Maggie O'Farrell has just been long listed for the Women's Prize. So I'm keen to read that one as well, but that's another story. Um, so there are all these figures and he then takes you on the, the, he takes you into their stories as well. And Till is just a, is a recurring character, but it is just really gorgeous. It's very inventive and what I love about Daniel Kelman's writing is that he has a sense of fun and playfulness and a, a sort of dry humour that is, you know, in the story throughout. And I think a perfect book at the moment because it's a real escapist book in the sense that it's set in the 1600s. It's a completely different time and place. There's a strong sense of place as well. And you have these historical figures, so you're learning a lot as you go, but it's a completely inventive 
takes you totally out of you know today's reality so I really recommend this I thoroughly enjoyed it so that was Till by Daniel Kelman and translated by Ross Benjamin and I also read in March one that I've been wanting to read for a long time Drive Your Plough Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk translated from the Polish by and Antonia Lloyd Jones and this is uh, Olga Tokarczuk who recently won the Nobel Prize for Literature and her previous book Flights was with the winner of the Man Booker International Prize a couple of years ago um, I didn't get on with Flights I found it I couldn't get into it it was a series of vignettes or short stories but some of them were more like essays and I couldn't get going with it as a, a novel at all. So that was flights. But then this one sounded more appealing because it was a it's sort of a whodunit. Um, the protagonist is Janina, but she doesn't like her name. So that's not used very often. But she's a woman in her 60s and she's living in a remote village in Poland. And then um, people start dying. So one man who's near sort of her neighbor but he's you know they're all quite remote he dies and at the same time there are hunters sorry there are hunters who've been killing the animals or who you know who shoot the wild animals there and she's a real animal lover so that has always disturbed her um, and she has a theory that the animals might be behind the murders because then another man dies in mysterious circumstances. So that premise sounds really interesting and I thought this will be more sort of approachable. I'll really get into it. And there's a lot that I really loved about it and there's, a again, a sense of humour and there's a strong sense of place and unique, interesting characters. So the protagonist also loves astrology and there's just some really interesting quirks in her character um, but I just didn't get on with it and Annie and I did a podcast episode about it recently and I think Annie really Annie really loved it I just couldn't get going I kept getting stopped in my tracks with the description of something and I never felt that the story had any tension or suspense the fact that she was sort of going to solve the murders that was very subtle it, it didn't come across like a real investigation to me it was just her going about her day and she'd get in her car or she'd have a drive or she'd look at her astrology or go out and walk in the snow go to the police station and a lot of it what Olga Tokachuk is doing in this book I really loved but I just didn't it was a book that I didn't want to pick up I didn't want to get back to yeah never really got going so unfortunately uh, this was a miss for me but I'd be really interested if you've read it uh, what you thought and um, she's clearly a very interesting and strong writer so I think it, it did do exactly what it set out to do um, but just for some reason it just didn't work for me so that was a shame but um, that does happen to me sometimes uh, with very highly esteemed authors so that was Drive Your Plough Over the Bones of the Dead and then I read Weather by Jenny Offal so this again is long listed for the Women's Prize I read Jenny Offal's Department of Speculation in January quite late to that party um, but really enjoyed it and it was interesting reading it now because I think when she wrote it it was probably a more inventive book in terms of the fragmented style and now uh, I think it's been imitated a bit. So you see more books that have that clipped, fragmented style um, of writing. But I still really enjoyed it. But I was nervous about weather because some of the reviews have suggested that it was quite bleak and that the protagonist has a lot of anxieties. And so if you're feeling anxious about climate change, for example, you know that it might be... Uh, a bit of a trigger for that so I was quite apprehensive but I really really loved it and I didn't um, I didn't feel that it was too bleak um, so the protagonist is I think it's Lizzie she's a librarian and she is also 
taking on a new job where she answers emails to which have written to her I think a podcast about the end of the world which her friend is hosting and so through that um, when she gets all the listener queries and she realizes people are really preparing for the end of the world maybe because of climate change and she starts to think she might need to prepare as well and that all develops through the book but it's also about her just her day-to-day her marriage she's got a child and a dog and she's sort of trying to hold it all together and feeling like a failure and it's all very subtly done because of that fragmented style Jenny Offal tells you a lot just in one sentence so you don't get a whole backstory but you get a real sense of Lizzie as a character and she's also trying to help her brother who has addiction problems and so there's a sort of very codependent relationship with her brother and again you just get updates in fragments but it is if I found that every you know that it tells you everything you need and I love the way that you can then read between the lines to you you really complete the story yourself which is so it's a more active way of reading but it's so engaging it doesn't feel like hard work yeah it was just really good and actually quite a comforting read I thought because Lizzie because she's a bit worried it makes you feel like you've got company with someone who is a bit worried by things and it normalizes that if you like so I thought and because there's also again a sense of humor um, I just thought it was so beautifully done and it doesn't feel laborious even though I'm sure that these sentences have been crafted meticulously it doesn't feel overworked Um, it has a lightness about it but also packs a punch so uh, I just was I was so impressed with this and really loved it so that's Weather by Jenny Offal Um, there's a yeah just a lot to unpick for a small book which I always love it'd be a good book club choice I think and then (laughs) from one extreme to the other this is another women's prize long-listed book The Mirror and the Light by Hilary Mantel and so it's 900 pages odd long and this is the third one in the trilogy with Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies and both of which I loved I think Wolf Hall was like a 10 out of 10 for me I loved the way she gives Thomas Cromwell the way she's created him as a character um, and giving you a sense of him going back to childhood and him having to survive and work his way up and just the I thought it was really fascinating in the Wolf Hall in particular the job that he had because he had King Henry VIII wanting to divorce his wife Catherine and marry Anne Boleyn and couldn't do that within the Catholic Church and so this idea of Thomas Cromwell helping him to achieve that legally and breaking away from the Catholic Church which changes everything in England you know in terms of the constitution and just the the whole religion of the country was absolutely fascinating so as a lawyer I really loved that that journey that he went on the strategies that he came up with and things like that I just really got into it and of course her writing is sublime so then we had bring up the bodies and that ended with plot spoiler um, the execution of Anne Boleyn and that's where the mirror and the light begins so and you know from the blurb and you know from history where this will end which you know again plot spoiler but Thomas Cromwell will come to the end of his life by the end of the book and that's what I suppose we've all been bracing ourselves for and it is yeah you do get all the feels so you know at the beginning I was so happy to be back with Hilary Mantel's writing which is exquisite and so vivid and just really lively and every scene she cuts to she has the perfect words to bring it to life and again you know she there's some humor there and just everything is pitch perfect with her writing and then at the end it was 
devastating. I won't say any more. Um, you know, I don't want to spoil it, even though it's not a spoiler technically, but it was really, really moving. And I think especially having been on the journey from Wolf Hall through Bring Up the Bodies and now this one, um, you've really, you know, been there with Thomas Cromwell. And so it's all of that. But I found in the middle, you know, the, there's because it is it is super long. I started to get frustrated and bored at times with um, just how sort of slowly it was moving, and it felt as if everything was being put in here. Or oh, it's a comprehensive account of that time in terms of all the manoeuvring and the the politics and the intrigue from different countries that was going on and. I felt as if that just started to weigh down the novel and it weighed on me and I found it was, you know, a slog at times. So I'm really interested to see what others, how you're finding it, if you've been reading it and Annie and I are catching up on Friday, so I can't wait to hear what Annie thought about it. But um, you have Henry VIII at the beginning, obviously he's, Anne Boleyn is dead now and he needs to find a new wife and we know obviously that he does find a new wife um, and we know that the next in line is Anne of Cleves and so you sort of I suppose part of the story is you're waiting to get to that point and it takes a long time for him to meet Anne of Cleves um, or Anna of Cleves as she was and I think they're setting up all the the reasons why that marriage was arranged um, that England has to be friends with Germany now because France and Spain might be conspiring and there were all the, you know a lot of stuff that I didn't know about so that was really interesting but it just seems to take it goes there quite meticulously and slowly and the other thing I struggled with because it was so long since I'd read Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies was remembering all those other characters, all the aristocrats and the dukes and the different names and so on. So I had to get my head around that again, but there's a very helpful cast of characters. So I kept just referring back to that. So it is an absolute must read if you enjoyed Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies because you need to see this to the end and you need to have completion and closure. Um, but for me, I didn't love reading it as much as I did those two. So um, it was a mixed experience. But anyway, let me know what you thought. It is still, I still think she's the most masterful writer of this you know historical fiction in terms of really making you feel as if you're there so um, again an incredible achievement by Hilary Mantel then I read uh, Underland by Robert McFarlane which is a non-fiction book about the underworlds of the earth including the natural landscape so caves and tunnels and underground mines and also the built up landscape like the catacombs in Paris and some areas in Greenland and Norway or Finland where they're storing nuclear waste for example and um, this has come so highly recommended it was in all of the lists last year and including in the critics personal favorites of the year and just has rave reviews and uh, Robert McFarlane has won so many awards and is very multi-talented because he's written non-fiction but also I think poetry or some of his his work has been adapted for stage and screen and music and all sorts of things um, and he's a really really interesting uh, highly achieving individual and I so I couldn't resist and also this beautiful cover by Stanley Donwood um, who also has worked with Radiohead uh, just absolutely gorgeous so I had to get it and then talked Amanda into reading it with me so we did it for the podcast and of course I just finished The Mirror and the Light which I found was weighing me down a bit and picked this up which is another 500 pages and I thought it would be a sort of an escape into nature um, and really enjoying the landscapes but it's more underground and dark and not quite that at all um, and I 
So I didn't love it as much as I wanted to, even though it does everything that it says it does. It deserves all of the praise. But I started to feel a bit kind of weighed down again because you have the weight of the earth above you. I felt a bit claustrophobic at times and I think I just wasn't in the right frame of mind for for something of this weight. And again, though, he's a beautiful writer Um, he's really intrepid he goes not just goes to these places but he actually goes caving and you know goes with the mining guys one of them drives him across these sort of like black sand dunes in the potash mine and like really dangerous sort of scenarios where it's incredibly hot and they're driving at full speed bumping over these dunes and it just sounds horrific to me but he's so you know I think quite brave and so intrepid and really does all these things and puts himself at risk even the catacombs in Paris there's one scene where they're crawling under a through a tunnel to get to a party because they have parties down there and he's in such a tight space that he can't actually move his head and I just couldn't think of anything worse but hats off to him what an amazing um, journey that that must have been to go to all these places and he's so erudite so he weaves in literature and Greek mythology and there's just there are so many references that really enrich this work and that's why I think it stands out from other non-fiction of you know in on similar topics so I really recommend it but just in terms of when you read it perhaps don't read it straight after the mirror and the light (laughs) and you know just pick the time where you're in the mood for some you know quite stimulating intelligent non-fiction and you've, you've got the headspace for it, I think. Or if you're really into caving and, you know, underground worlds, you will love it. And Amanda absolutely loved it. So that was good. I, so I didn't feel too bad for recommending that to her. Um, so that was Underland. And I think that's all I read in March. So that was the mirror and the light really took out a, a good week or so of that month. Let me know what you've been reading and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.